You may recall the Solomon design from when we talked about a different design effect and trying to account for potential confounds with repeated measurement or repeated testing. Now recall the Solomon four group design begins with random assignment of individuals to one of these four different groups. And in fact, what this actually is, is a factorial design where the two factors are whether or not there is a pretest and whether or not the treatment or the manipulation is involved in a specific group. So in other words, if one factor is pretest with two different levels, yes or no, and the other factor is treatment or manipulation with two different levels, yes or no, then the factorial combination of those two design elements produces the four groups shown in the Solomon design. So group one has both the pretest and the treatment. Group two has just the treatment. So in other words, for at the level of treatment yes, we have pretest yes and pretest no. That gives us our first two groups. For the other level of the first factor, treatment, that is treatment no, then again we have pretest yes and pretest no. And that gives us groups three and four respectively. And then exactly what we talked about is we can look at whether or not there is a main effect of the pretest. In other words, whether or not there is pretest priming. So does just having the pretest lead to an increase in performance or a change in performance? In this case, that would be a main effect of the pretest. We can also look at is there a treatment effect involved here? In particular, is our manipulation X having an effect for positive or negative? That would be a main effect of the treatment in this design. Then the interaction effect here would be exactly what we referred to before as pretest sensitization. That is, that the effect of the treatment depends on whether or not the individuals had the pretest. And the Solomon four group design is the only way to determine whether or not that pretest sensitization is occurring which is exactly the same thing as saying that a factorial design of any sort is the only way to determine whether or not this interaction effect is occurring. But let's look at some other research examples as well. Consider a mental rotation task as we looked at before, where you're shown one stimulus and then you have to identify which of other possible candidate stimuli it matches. So given the shape on the left, which of one, two, three, or four matches this geode rotated somehow through space. Which one is it? Number one. And as I mentioned offhand somewhat in lecture, males tend to do slightly better on these types of uh, spatial perception, spatial manipulation types of tasks. But there are also tasks where females tend to do better, and that is in an object memory task. So the way this is typically investigated is if I show you an array of objects, I ask you to study these for a second. And then I show you another set of objects and I ask you to identify which ones were in that first slide. Then you could check off which ones in fact occurred in that first slide then I can measure your performance or your accuracy on this task as well. And this is the type of task that females actually tend to do slightly better, in fact, than males on, okay, is identifying, correctly identifying which of the objects in the second picture were present in the first picture as well. Now, what we can do is if we think about this, if we have a group of males and a group of females, both doing the mental rotation task or the object memory task, well, then we can think about what we have, for example, is a group of females doing the mental rotation task, a group of females doing the object memory task, a group of males doing the mental rotation task, and a group of males doing the object memory task. So we can measure the performance across these four different groups. Let's say that we get performance numbers like those shown here. And again, rather than looking at this as a single factor with four levels, instead what we can do is to look at it as a factorial design, because that's really what we have going on here. So let's color code these to make it a little bit easier and see what's going to be going on. Okay? What we can really do is the way that we look at these factorial designs is rather than to look at these four groups in this fashion. Okay? Let's move the males underneath the females here 
And when we set it up like this, then what you may notice now is what we really have is a more systematic presentation where we have gender identified by the two different rows. That is, those individuals that are in the two groups in the top row are male, or female, sorry, and those in the bottom row are male. Okay. So which row we're on in this sort of two by two table identifies what the gender is, and which column we're in, whether we're on the left side or the right side, identifies which task we did, the mental rotation task on the left, or the object memory task on the right. We can also look at a plot then of those accuracy scores that I showed you before. Okay. If you want to rewind and copy them down, or if you noticed them before, it doesn't really matter, but we can plot those. Let's plot the ability or the accuracy score of those. Okay, so what we may want to do here is let's say on the left, let's plot the mental rotation score. On the right, the object memory score. Okay, then what we're going to have is different lines or different bars or whatever we're going to be using here for different genders. Okay, so let's plot the scores for the males, which are on the bottom row here, the green and the yellow groups. We can plot the scores for the males who do well on the mental rotation task, but they do somewhat worse on the object memory task, as I mentioned before. We can then also plot the scores for the women, the red and the blue groups. And as I mentioned before, they do worse than the males on the mental rotation task, but they do better than the males on the object memory task. And then if we use lines to connect our two groups here, so now we see one line for the males, their performance decreasing as we move across tasks from mental rotation to object memory, and the females whose performance is increasing as we move from mental rotation to object memory. So this is the way that we can identify in a graph the results that we mentioned earlier for the, these two different groups. Now what type of design would we call this? What type of factorial design would we label this as? Indeed it would be a two by two factorial design. We have two different factors so each one needs a number. How many different genders are there? There's two. So that's where our first number two comes from. How many different tasks are there? There's two, and that's what makes it a two by two factorial design. But what if we were to extend this design? Then we can maybe think about how we might relabel it. So another thing we can then do is to think about extending this design, moving beyond the different tasks and the different genders that we had, and think about how that's going to affect what our graph is going to look like, what types of effects we're going to be able to analyze and exactly how we're going to identify or label the design. So we've seen that this is called a two by two design and we've seen what a graph of this might look like. But what if we extend this even further? What if we recruit some more males and females and have them do a different task like a verbal task? Now, how would we identify this type of design? What would be the label for this type of factorial design? Would it be a two by two by two factorial design? No. Would it be a two by three factorial design? Yes, it would. Now, it wouldn't be a two by two by two factorial design because that suggests that we have three different factors or independent variables, each one of them having two different levels. Well then, if that's the case, what is our third variable here, or our third factor? No, we haven't added a new independent variable. All we've added is a new level of one of our existing independent variables. We've changed a two by two design, shown here. We've changed one of those twos, added a level to it, and instead of having two levels, now it has three levels. So instead of a two by two, it becomes a two by three design. In terms of our graph, if we're just adding another task, what we would add is an extension of our graph to the right as well. We would add another point to the two different lines. Let's say this is the performance of the men and the women on the verbal task. Okay, we can extend the design in the other way as well. Now using gender as an example, it's kind of tricky to extend to some third gender, but what if you had some oddball alien type of gender or something that you're looking at here? Okay, in terms of the graph, what this would do would be to add a third line. Because what we're plotting as our different lines are the different rows, or levels of one factor, gender. What we're plotting as points on a single line are the different tasks in which that gender is engaged. So if we were to add a third level of gender in this case, we would have to add a third, a new line as well. 
and what would be the label for this type of factorial design. Now we've changed our other 2 in the original 2x2 two two to a 3. In other words, this is a 3x3 three three factorial design, identified with 3 rows and 3 columns. If we were to add another factor, it would be very difficult to plot on a two-dimensional screen such as the one you're looking at right now. Okay, so hopefully now you guys are able to identify these different types of factorial designs, be able to accurately label examples of factorial designs, and understand how the results from these types of designs would be present in a graph such as the one shown on the right here.